Hello everyone, welcome to MedTech Digital Week, brought to you by the organizers of MedTech Series. My name is Filippo and I will be your host for today's session titled The Role of RA in the Clinical and Performance Evaluation Process, Key Strategies to Support Project Success. First, I will cover some quick housekeeping items. If you experience difficulties with audio or advanced slides, refresh your screen with F5. If you are experiencing other issues, hit the question mark button to receive assistance. At any time during the presentation, submit your questions in the Q&A window on the left-hand side of your screen. In 24 hours, you receive a link to watch the recording of this session. Let's now begin by introducing our speaker from Creator Edge, the president, Laurie Mitchell. Thank you for joining us today, Laurie. Now I will hand it over to you to begin the presentation. Thank you, Filippo. Hi, everyone. This is Laurie Mitchell. I'm the president of Criterion Edge, and welcome. Thank you for coming to this presentation today. Today, we're talking about the role of regulatory affairs in the clinical and performance evaluation process, and what are some key strategies that you might uh, deploy in your role as the um, regulatory affairs person that is overseeing a particular clinical evaluation report submission or even a performance evaluation report in IVD uh, to MDR, under MDR or IVDR. So let's talk a little bit about that. So rec in my opinion, so Criterion Edge, I'll, I'll start with a little preamble about who Criterion Edge is. Criterion Edge, we are a regulatory writing company, a focused service provider of regulatory, scientific, and medical writing services. And as such, as you can imagine, we've been very busy over the last few years writing um, reports, clinical evaluation reports, and other deliverables for um, a com compliance with under MDR. And of course, the IVD companies are coming on board with their, com their compliance needs for IVDR. So that's who we are, and, and our, my comments today are presented from the point of view of a medical writer. So in our opinion, regulatory affairs is poised to play a critical role in supporting MDR and IVDR required the, the clinical or performance evaluation report process from pre-project planning through implementation, report writing, and finally the on-time submission to the notified body. And so beginning with these early critical planning stages through completion of all required deliverables. This presentation examines some of the key drivers of project success, such as early strategic decisions around the route of conformity, data, data sufficiency, equivalence considerations, internal readiness of critical documentation, project planning strategies and how to identify potential roadblocks, and proactively find solutions to common problems. So let's get started. Today, I hope that you're going to learn to identify the critical components of the CER process that influence project success. And I'll just linger on that a moment just for ease of presentation. This particular presentation applies to performance evaluation reports in the IVD space as well. But I don't want to keep saying I, you know, PER or CER. So for just to shorten it, I'm going to say CER throughout this, per, per, throughout this um, presentation. Describe how regulatory affairs can support cross-functional stakeholders and lead critical decision-making throughout the planning, preparation, writing of the CER, and recognize and implement early mitigation strategies to overcome roadblocks and drive to that all-important on-time submission. So I've, div I've uh, divided up this process in this type of way, from pre-launch and planning, scoping, kickoff, report writing, review and sign off, and then ultimately submission. And I'm going to have some key tips here and there on some of my slides. And the key tip here is to plan on three plus months of active report writing, at least. Uh, anything less than that, you're beginning to cut into critical time that either your team or your medical writing team uh, or vendor is going to need to actually write this probably the most complex report that is a re single report 
that is required in our industry. This is a very, very complex report. If you haven't figured that out already, which I'm sure you all have. So three plus months, active report writing right there in the middle. Let's talk about the pre-launch. This is, in, in our opinion, again, from a medical writing standpoint, it's one of the most critical times for active regulatory affairs engagement because it sets the project up for success. So what are some of the key tasks during this phase? First of all, where do you stand? Perform a gap assessment. Where do your documents stand? Critical review of clinical data sources. Do you, do you are you worried about data sufficiency? Status of, as I said, your key CER input documents. Establish a clear regulatory strategy based upon all that you know. Involve internal stakeholders in those early decisions and pre-planning activities. And what do I mean by a clear regulatory strategy? Is, this a, is your device a legacy device? Is it a wet device? Um, will it qualify under Article 6110? Are you worried about data sufficiency so you're hoping that you can establish equivalence with another device of your own? These are all critical decisions that you need to, meet, to make. And I'll just linger a moment on this equivalence issue. Equivalence is a, is a very exacting bar in the CER write-up. You have, we encourage all of our clients to internally create a dis, uh, an equivalence justification. Do the exercise yourself. Every clinical, technical, biological aspect of your devices, do they match? Are they either the same? And if they're not the same, then that means they're similar. And a justification needs to be written up as to why they're, and it's a short justification. This doesn't need to be a long page full of information. Just what is the justification if the um, two aspects are similar? What is the justification for um, that there is no clinical impact to the patient for that? For example, I always take the example of a guide wire. Um, if your predicate device guide wire's marker was yellow and in, in the equivalent device, the current device, it's now blue, there's clearly no clinical impact to the patient. That's what I mean by step, but that's a similar, that's not a same because the color is different. So it's that kind of exacting thing. That is very helpful to your writers because we won't know what, can't always know all of the details of those similarities, but your blocking that out first is a, is a key um, component to success of the project. So if you're considering equivalence, do the homework internally first to make sure that that works. Identify your critical um, internal or even external resources. Do you have a writing team? Is it prepped and trained? Uh, do you, or do, are you going to identify someone, in the, someone who doesn't look busy over the next three months on your team and you're gonna have them write it? Um, a non-experienced uh, CER writer is, is going to be a potential slowdown for your team. So keep that in mind as well. And what are your internal systematic literature review capabilities? Do you have them? Are you clear about what the MDR and, and IVDR demand uh, in a CER for that documentation and that methodology? Uh, because there's, the thing I always say about this is that Systematic literature review is how you identify published data on your device for the most part, or in your competitor device, how you establish your acceptance criteria and state of the art. So if that methodology is not crystal clear to your notified body reviewer every step of the way, and to them that means reproducible, if they could look at what clearly at what you wrote in the CER as far as your documentation of your methodology, that they could do it themselves and come up with this, virtually the same results. That's their bar. And uh, so be very specific about your systematic literature review capabilities um, because it's data. 
that you're looking for. And if they question your systematic literature review methodology, they will question your data. So that's a very important um, aspect as well. And time, we're here talking about time today, and please allow ample time. Literature review and report writing are the two single most time sucks in this whole process. Um, other than delays created by maybe inter your internal lack of preparedness or changing, that's another time suck as well. So that's why I cautioned you all, do this gap assessment, do this pre-launch, get your ducks in a row, because once you start the clock on the report writing, you've only got so much time after that. And my tip is, you'll hear me say this a lot, do not underestimate your need for time. It's better to have more than less. Scoping and kickoff. So if you've, you've done all your pre-work. You're ready to start the project. It has a beginning, as I always say, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So we're going to start that. So what does that look like? Key tasks during that phase. Identify your writing team if you haven't already. And those responsible for writing the CER, CEP, who is your lead writer if there are other people helping. Know, know the players um, and who's responsible for what. Again, review those CER input documents. If you, during your gap assessment, you had to have some things revved or updated, your IFU for sure, um, are they done? Are you finished? Or if you're not finished with them, when will they be finished for sure? Um, so that writing team should be familiar with your key document inputs. And what is the most key document? The IFU. There's no document more important than that to the writing team. It contains, we know what it all contains. And those are the backbones of the CER, intended purpose, um, so on and so forth, indications, anatomic locations, all of that. Your writing team or your writer can get started uh, just with a final IFU alone. We can get a lot done just with that, building out a lot of sections. So that's a critical document. And again, assessing your systematic literature review capabilities. Identify scoping questions to review at the kickoff meeting. So have a kickoff meeting is what I, I guess I'm saying here. Have a formal kickoff meeting. You're starting a, probably one of the most important projects that you know, your company will do that year, the CER, to maintain your certificate in uh, the European Union. So this is pretty important. You don't want to obviously you don't want to mess this up. So have a kickoff meeting, get everyone aligned. Um, and then what are the scoping questions you want to review at the kickoff meeting? What are your unanswered questions? Gaps, questions for at the kickoff meeting. Uh, review and clarify those questions and answers and approaches to ensure alignment between whoever's responsible for writing and whoever is responsible in regulatory affairs usually to deliver this project at the end of the day. Whoever it is, whether it's leading this team, whether it's regulatory or clinical, regulatory still should ensure that this step of kickoff and scoping isn't missed because it aligns the team. And we're all on the same page with what's working and what still needs to be decided, done, and developed in order to keep the writing team moving along. And then have a formal kickoff and invite, consider inviting the, writing, the writer or the writing team, project management, clinical, regulatory. And uh, here at Criterion Edge, we have a scoping checklist that we actually use that collects, has questions, collects answers and decisions that we use at the kickoff meeting. So that's a great tip if you should want to develop that. Okay, next question. Next slide. Active report writing. This is at three plus month phase. So how can RA support during this phase of the project? This is the long slog where there is a lot of writing and this is where, it's not just writing, this is where all the questions and the issues come up, guaranteed. This is where whatever you forgot or whatever you missed or whatever you've changed, had to change or wanted to change, it all c 
comes down to this section, this part of the um, process, the report writing. Because now it's, as I always say, pen to paper. You're writing it now. There's no, it's not theoretical anymore. It has to be written in a CER. CERs, it's not un uncommon for CERs to be 300, 400, 700 pages long. It all depends on a lot of different factors, and um, they can be they can be quite lengthy. So this is a big job. That's why you should plan at least three months for active writing. So again, how can RA help in this phase? Ensure the timely deliverable the delivery of critical documents from your cross-functional colleagues. Technical documentation that you know, engineering or design development, uh, device development, they might be still working on. Get them going on that. Your, your writing team is waiting. The IFU, if it's being revved, which is never a great idea, a great plan, if the I, IFU is not final when you kick off this project. If it needs to be revved um, somewhere after, at some point or finalized at some point after the uh, writing has kicked off, I can tell you that the writers have already written quite a bit of information that's in the IFU. And the longer you go before the IFU, it's like, oh, we have something in the IFU that needs to be fixed or altered. Um, that could literally create a day's worth of delays in your writing project because the writers are going to have to go through the CER draft and pick every spot out where they mentioned that part of the IFU that um, is now being changed. And that's a laborious and time consuming project. And also fraught with peril. They could miss a spot where you've removed an indication uh, or an anatomic location and they've missed it. And the notified body will just catch that. So it's, it's, that's a tough thing if the IFU gets changed. Risk management reports. We're going to need those with the way we write CERs. We tend to need those more towards the latter half of the of the project. So um, they they're not needed right up front. The IFU is needed right at the beginning. The risk management is absolutely needed, probably about halfway or two thirds of the way through, and because that's the next to the last section of the CER. Your PMS data. Uh, here's a hint for your writers. Please don't give them raw data, thousands of rows, for example, hundreds or thousands of rows in an Excel spreadsheet. That is an enormous amount of time that the writer is going to need to take just to put that into tables. Um, I don't think you want your writers doing that type of work when your internal PMS team could prepare tables uh, of your PMS in a PMS report. So that we have we have been handed. Um, basically raw data from PMS on just a few occasions. And it's a, that's a huge slowdown. Um, and actually, we usually push back and say, you, you're going to need to put this in tables for us. It's, um, it, it, we, can't, we don't have the time to do that. So uh, that's another hint as well, to get your PMS data cleaned up and ready to drop right into the CER. Handle regulatory affairs uh, can handle roadblocks probably better than anybody or well positioned to do it. There can be stalled decision making. Um, that's common. Um, there can be group think going on amongst all the cross functional stakeholders. Somebody on one team wants something to be one way. Somebody on another team feels strongly that it should be another way. Um, we, we get that as writers. But at some point, we need a final decision if we're going to make this happen. So you can help with that regulatory affairs. You can help with that stalled decision making. You know, drive towards getting clear feedback back to the writer so that they can clearly write it in the CER. Unresponsiveness um, is, is sometimes a problem uh, for us if we are emailing and we're not hearing back. We need a decision or we need a, a document. We need some clarity, and someone's not getting back to us. And we get that everybody's busy, um, but we all have a deadline. So RA can help them stick that. A delayed documentation from somebody, same thing. 
So you really are serving as a key resource to the writing team. Um, you can find the answers to questions that others can't, especially for an external vendor. We have great relationships with the internal cross-functional team, but we don't always know who's the keeper of the answers, who's the best person to seek an answer from. So you can help with that and to ensure that the writing team is getting what they need. And then you always keeping your eye on the project cadence and helping to enforce timelines on everybody, including the writing team. Um, we, are, we are driven, we live and die by our timelines. And, and in this particular case, so many things can go sideways when you're writing a CER. There can be so many unexpected, even delays. Nothing, it never goes smoothly. There is always roadblocks to handle. So any help that the writing team can get is well appreciated. So here we are, we're almost there. This is the review and sign off. The finish line is in sight. You've been doing this for months now. And really you can make an impact at this final stage. Key tasks during this review stage is to plan in advance for the cross-functional review of the CEP and CER and other related documents. Um, this is no small task, as I know many of you have been involved with uh, CER reviews. It can go on for sometimes too long. And so prep the reviewers to be ready. There's a project plan. There's always a project plan for the CER. If the, re in, you know, the first round of review is scheduled for, you know, the first through the fifth for internal review, then RA, you can help those cross-functional reviewers be ready during that time. If they have a packed calendar from the first to the fifth and they have no time set aside to review the document in total, then how are they going to get that done? So help with that. And, and by the way, let's talk a little bit about reviewing the CER. Reviewing the CER to us is always the full CER. We review, we, we produce for the first review the full draft of the CER from beginning to end. Why is that the case? Because the CER is a finely knitted together report. What you say in section one, what you say in section two, three, five, eight, and conclude. Um, it's, it's, there are so many throughput lines of storylines, information, strategic conversations. The CER is very, very much a story. It is not just a recitation of the facts. It's, it's a story that begins in the state-of-the-art section and moves through to the risk-benefit section. And um, that's why we always present a full CER for um, the review, not pieces. Because it's like reading a, a book one chapter, reading chapter five in a book, and then reading chapter one, and then reading the final chapter. It doesn't, the, the story doesn't make any sense if you review like that. You review the entire book, and in this case, the entire CER. So it takes time. So engage those people early to block some time. Continue to handle roadblocks during this period of time. There's a, can, because this is where now people say, no, I want it this way, and another cross-functional review saying, I think this should be changed to that. Well, the writers are just waiting for someone to make a final decision so they can fix it. Um, so you can, again, uh, uh, help with stalled decision-making. And, you know, we sure hope there are no unresponsive cross-functional stakeholders, but that, take, that happens sometimes. Again, they're very busy. And uh, oftentimes, like we say, we ask, you know, regulatory affairs will suggest, can I block time on their calendars? Uh, there are still delayed documents, we sure hope, but not at that time. I'll say one more thing about the review. Uh, we have occasionally been asked, can't we just sit down and all hold hands together, have the whole cross-functional team on, and do a review 
all at the same time. These, we get that. We sometimes do that, you know, comment resolution or even review kind of resolution. We do that sometimes, uh, but almost never with a CER. They're simply too large. This is too large and too complex. Uh, doing a review round and hashing out issues in a sit-down meeting would put six people on a six-hour call, and then we probably still wouldn't get it done. So we don't, rec we don't recommend having a, a review like that. Everyone should review their own sections, or, and, and as we tend to say, stay in your lane, cross-functional reviewers. Don't worry about, for us, the first review is the pre-draft. So there may be a typo or two in there. Please don't worry about a period is missing or a capitalization is missing. We'll fix that in our review. In, and in our final QC. So when I say stay in your lane, I know that sounds a little rude, but what I mean by that is stay with what you know, why you're there at the table reviewing. And that is the most useful to the writers. And then always at this time, regulatory affairs, enforce the submission timeline, you're almost there. Keep people moving. And um, one tip here I wanted to point out some folks have um, cross-functional or even external medical reviewers, and those external medical reviewers, because they don't work for you, they sometimes can be hard to wrangle their time. They're usually busy physicians, and um, so again, they're pretty important because everything stops if they haven't if they haven't weighed in yet. So we've worked on probably too many CERs where we were all done. So the team was still trying to wrangle doctor somebody who can't who doesn't have the time to do the review so that can be a potential slowdown as well submission the words the the blessed words uh, that RA is so happy to hear the writing is done the report is reviewed signed off and in the hands of the regulatory team what are the key tasks during this phase what's well, not it's not really us. We're the writers. We're done. It's been reviewed. The final document has been has been delivered. The CEP, the CER, other documents. But uh, for your point of view, you're of course gathering and prepping all those documents for submission. You're collecting signatures, usually including our lead writer, and then you're filing, and then you submit to the notified body, and you're done. And that is the end of our our uh, session today. Let me um, go to the next slide and see what we've got. Right. We've got uh, time for questions and uh, any kind of discussion. So, Filippo, is, can I turn it over to you at this point? Yeah, thank you so much, Lori, for an excellent presentation. We have received a few questions already, but we'll give the rest of your moment to enter your question in the Q&A box to the left of the slides. Before we begin the Q&A, I will run through some brief comments. Firstly, I would like to thank Elsevier, Critter, and Edge at Clever Medtech, Compliance and Risks for sponsoring this digital week. Next, I would like to inform you that our Medtech Summit US will be returning to Chicago this December, and our flagship European event, Medtech Summit, will be returning to Brussels in June 2023. Now back to Lori to begin the Q&A. Uh, first question. How would you integrate clinical evaluation into the design and development process? Oh, that's a great question. How do you integrate <clears throat> clinical evaluation and the considerations for your clinical evaluation needs into the one of the very earliest stages, which is the design and development process? So we've got some ideas about that. I, for example, one thing that I didn't mention in this um, in this webinar is the importance of having identified your key safety and performance objectives that you will be using in your CER for the device under evaluation. Those, we find a lot of our clients have not given that, or many, I, I won't say a lot, but many of our clients have not yet developed safety and performance objectives when it's time to write the CER. 
and your safety and performance objectives are the way that you measure the um, effectiveness of your clinical data on your device. So the safety and performance objectives <clears throat> should be identified early on in your the design phase and your device phase as you're, during your, the development. What are you developing that device to do? What is, what is its purpose, intended purpose? Thus, then, how would you measure the safety and performance of the device for its intended purpose? That, that can be, you can be thinking about that while you're uh, designing your device and getting those safety and performance objectives at least blocked out, maybe not finalized, but be thinking about them then because that's the data that you're going to run. I always say for those of you that have run clinical, internal clinical investigations on your devices, those are your endpoints. Safety and performance objectives are essentially your clinical investigation endpoints, or at least a few of them. So that's why, and the safety and performance objectives, when it comes to the CER writing, are almost everything. They, they frame the entire discussion from beginning, state-of-the-art section, to the end, risk-benefit, they frame the entire CER. So they are foundational to the CER. So be thinking about safety and performance objectives in your de design and development phase, and that will help set you up for success um, as you walk through your clinical development plan, and then on and on it goes through the throughput all the way out to the CER. Next, how to create actionable safety and performance objectives? Oh, okay. So that that's a great follow-on question. How to how to um, create actionable safety and performance objectives? Well, there's a look. If you have clinical investigations internally, look to those as I just suggested, and look to those endpoints. Those you consider to be your key data points running in clinical investigations. Those should be continue to be your key, key data points, both for safety and for performance. One hint about in the CER, we are often asked, how many safety and performance objectives do we need? Um, I will start with this answer. It does not and should not be an exhaustive list. Generally speaking, we have gone with as little as one safety uh, objectives and two or three um, performance objectives. Usually never more than three safety and three performance objectives. Your, these are your key objectives. They are not meant to be comprehensive. They are meant to be um, safety and performance objectives that your competitors are reporting on and that you report on or most importantly, that you have data for. We talk to some of our clients that are very concerned about data sufficiency and they have very little data on their devices. So what data you do have, you should design your safety and performance objectives as long as it's, as it's meaningful data, I'll say that caveat. But if you have some meaningful data on your device, make sure your safety and performance objectives match those data because if you you can't put extra data in the CER that you don't have safety and performance objectives for all data sets presented in the CER PMS PMCF clinical investigations published data on your device all those data sets are going to be compared to your safety and performance objectives so choose wisely What are the most common problems encountered during literature screening, review, and data extraction? The most common problems uh, encountered during the uh, systematic literature review process is lack of preparedness on the, on the part of the client, I would say, or on the part of the decision-making team. Let's put it that way. What are your safety and performance objectives? Do you know your PICO terms? Do you know what it is you're looking for and what you 
are not looking for. We have uh, at Criterion Edge, we have a um, dedicated systematic literature review team uh, led by um, one of our directors uh, and also by medical librarians. And we have two or three librarians on staff, and they're very well versed in this type, these types of searches, and they're looking for certain things. They're looking for those safety and performance objectives. They're looking for a, a, a short competitor list. They're looking for those PICO terms. Um, and there's often decisions that need to come up during the search so that you get the best search results possible. Uh, in other words, you don't get a bloated, you don't put out a bloated search protocol that brings back a thousand uh, hits, references, of which 850 of those are junk. You don't want that, nor do you want the opposite, which is you've made it so narrow and prescriptive that you're actually missing data that's published. So your medical librarian can guide you very well on that, and so should your writer. Your writer should know this this background very well and be able to understand when the search protocol is written just right. So that is another this uh, this uh, that's another suggestion during this. Who should review and who should approve the EER? Mm -hmm. Well, um, if, if approve means signs off on it, like on the signature page, or does approve, I mean, so approve could be something that internally your regulatory affairs leader would be approving their section, like the cross-functional team is approving. I think there's sort of two levels of approval. One is when you're going through Usually, in our experience, it's two rounds of review, reviewing the full CER. And at some point at the end of the second round, all of the reviewers should be, quote, approving their sections, which in mass means they're also approving the entire CER. So who should approve that? All the reviewers, ultimately, should all agree, I would say agree, that this is the final version of the CER. And then who approves it beyond that could be up to your own internal SOPs or whoever, whatever your signatories, whoever your signatories are going to be. But it's a group, my point is, and I think at the heart of the question, is that it should be, it should be all internal stakeholders should uh, be reviewing from each department and, quote, approving the final CER. And then those, usually all of those signatures are on the signature page of the CER, including the writer. In your opinion, what is the single biggest trap to avoid? Um, I, I've got an easy one, time, the lack of time. The single easiest and biggest trap to avoid is time, and you can control that. Give yourself time. If, you're, if your submission is six months from now, you should be talking and engaging with your team right now. It's better to have too much time than not enough and because you, you can never take time back. And that submission deadline, as I don't need to tell any of you, is hard and fast and, and usually very immovable. And when teams are rushed, uh, that is a recipe for mistakes. It, it's just human nature. Even as experienced as our team is, when we are rushed and put under pressure and asked to do something in two weeks that should take five weeks, um, there's, you're, you're, at, you're at peril for human error is going to be introduced at that point. QC processes are rushed or even skipped because there's no time. So th this is the reason that time is so important. You don't want your notified, but you don't want any unforced errors in your CER. Your notified body is going to have plenty to talk about in their review. And it's 
what you don't want them to focus on is when there are unforced errors, human errors in the CER, because what that does to the notified body, it makes them start to doubt the quality of the whole CER, and you don't want that. So give people time to do the best job possible. And uh, you didn't mention the vice claims. Assume this would be bundled into the intended use proposed statement and the IFU. Should the CER list the device claims and how they are advanced or proposed to be evidenced in the clinical evaluation plan? Thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, so this is about claims. So no, we, I didn't mention claims. Claims, um, I can talk a bit about where for us, claims tend to live um, in the CER. Claims to us live in the uh, risk benefit section of the CER. So you'll hear a little criterion edge philosophy about the um, risk benefit section of the CER. Other than the state of the art section, it is the most, the state of the art section and the risk benefit section, if I haven't said this already, are the two most important sections of the CER. The SOA starts, sets you, starts you on a good path. And the risk benefit section is where all of the conclusions are made. The actual conclusion section of the CER basically just tells the reader what they just read. But the, but the arguments are made in the risk benefit section. And that includes the incorporation of claims by the manufacturer because, because part of the risk benefit section is benefits. So you, in that section, this is the, other than the state of the art, this is the most complex sec section to write by far. And, in, and it's just as important as the state of the art section because it is where your conclusion comes to live. That's where it's made. So in the claims section, it is claims are linked to clinical benefits and clinical benefits must be supported by clinical data. That's a, that's the easiest way I can say it. So if you claim that you're, if a manufacturer claim says that our device does something faster than something else, then that word faster, that's the claim word in there. So where do you have safety and performance data that claim that your device does something faster or um, results in some sort of improved outcome. So we're now getting into, and I just did a webinar on this about linking together clinical outcomes, claims, benefits, um, safety and performance objectives, all of this. There's, there's that through line in the CER about linking your safety and performance objectives uh, to your, out, your clinical outcomes that you expect, and then how that wraps up with uh, clinical benefits. So you do present benefits as either that are identified out of the state of the art review because benefits are for the technology, not your device in particular, but the technology are identified out of the state of the art section review. I'll give you an example. Um, drug eluding cardiac stents versus bare metal stents or versus another way of um, opening up a thrombus in a coronary artery. Drug eluding stents are really, you know, the kind of the highest bar. They are the, they are the best methodology for um, removing, in most cases, removing or mitigating a thrombus in a, in, a, in a coronary artery occlusion. Let me just put it that way. So the benefits of, of that could be that you have um, that that you get out of the state of the art is a, a statement like in the state of the art that um, drug eluding stents provide um, improved patient outcomes versus medical therapy alone. That seems like an obvious statement, but that is a statement out of the state of the art analysis that is a benefit. That's a benefit statement. 
okay, how do you measure that benefit statement? That's a clinical outcome. And out of your clinical outcomes come your safety or your performance objectives. So if you have more questions about this, I just did a webinar uh, earlier this week or last week, whatever it was, um, on that very thing. Um, and we talk a little bit about there and about claims and benefits and outcomes and how to link those all together. I hope that might help. So thanks for your question. It's a complex one. <laughs> Um, what about the legacy devices being in the market since decades? A clinical strategy plan can include proactive PMS, PMCF only, correct? So legacy, legacy devices have been on the market, market for decades. A clinical strategy plan can include proactive PMS, PMCF only, correct? Um, that's with regards to gathering data on your device. So yes, that's a great plan, actually, because you're not going to have clinical investigations. People do not write about guide wire, or let's just say a, some sort of a guide wire. Let's just say guide wire. Um, they are a part of a procedure, but I want to plant the seed in, in this about these types of legacy devices, is that don't forget about um, surrogate endpoints. For example, on a legacy device such as I just mentioned, a guide wire, uh, a, so say it's a coronary guide wire. A, a surrogate endpoint can be that was your, for safety or per, let's just say performance for your guide wire, was there um, a procedural success? Was, this, was the procedure a success? Yes or no? Um, because if it was a success, that's a surrogate endpoint for the um, guide wire being successful. So that's a performance um, objective for your guide wire, a surrogate performance objective. That's absolutely acceptable. So be thinking about hints, uh, little hints like that or ways to, so it was there, were there any bleeding events? Or it can just be sometimes your safety or performance can just be, or safety, could just be AEs. Now that's not a great approach, but it could be a, a specific types of AEs. Like, were there any perforations? Um, what, what were your bleeding events? And were they related to the guide wire? So that's some examples there. For class four products, that do not have direct contact, what's the proper approach when it comes to the clinical evaluation? For class uh, one products, it looks like it says class one products. I see a capital I. Uh, so I'm guessing that's what that says. That do not have direct contact. What is the proper approach when it comes to clinical evaluation? Your regulatory strategy you're a very, very clear regulatory strategy, such as Article 6110, for example. So when you're doing, um, when you have those types of, those types of issues, um, uh, you, you need a very clear regulatory strategy first. And I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir. You're probably thinking, well, of course we know we need a clear reg regulatory strategy. But given the requirements of the CER and the clinical evaluation process of which the report is an outcome of that process. So we remember, sometimes we say it's the requirement of the CER. No, it's a requirement of MDR and the evaluation process, clinical evaluation process as a whole. So your regulatory strategy and approach is, a, is one of the first places you need to be thinking about. And uh, that could be that could be a, a an issue. Is that if you're you know you have to think about your regulatory strategy first. And six, Article sixty one ten uh, leaps to mind for that one. They do not have direct contact. What are the requirements for CER writers and viewers? Do they have to have a particular background? 
Oh, this, that's a good question. The requirements for the CER writers and reviewers, do they have to have a particular background? Okay, I'll, I'll break that question into two questions because it's different for writers than it is for reviewers. Um, there is broad language, I would say, within the MDR and other applicable guidelines uh, about the, the writer uh, capabilities. You know, it's like, what is their background and experience? And I think sometimes that there is confusion amongst our clients about that the clinical evaluators must have background and experience, whatever exactly the language is, in this area. Okay, we understand that. But we're the writers, and writers are not the approvers, and we're not the reviewers. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of scrutiny on everybody who might be helping write a CER. We're a, we use a team approach, and we have one lead writer who is responsible for the CER, one. Now, does that mean that that doesn't mean that that lead writer isn't having somebody help them with the shell of the report or somebody help them block out the, de the uh, design, the device description section, or somebody work on the non-clinical uh, section? There's always helpers, but at the end of the day, there's a single writer that is um, responsible for that. They should have experience. But then there are the reviewers, um, and the reviewers are the decision makers. They're the, the, they're the evaluators. Uh, they need to have a, a lot of experience, too, in the therapeutic area and whatever is appropriate for that therapeutic area. Do And we're often asked, do we post the CVs of all of the people involved uh, in the CER? Absolutely not. I, I, I haven't put a CV in a CER in a, a few years now. They're just not, they're not published in the CER. Are our writers and uh, a very, very um, experienced? Absolutely. Um, and obviously the reviewers from the manufacturer, your your qualifications are should be uh, impeccable as well. But your CVs don't need to be published in a CER, in our experience. We haven't done that in quite some time. So I hope that helped answer your question. What's your experience for uniformity of review by a given notified body? Oh. <laughs> um, well, um, I, I can't, two review teams, three opinions is what the rest of it says. Uh, I, I can't think, we see, I can tell you too, in our experience um, with our clients, if we've written the CER, we will always be available if the client wants us to um, work on the regulatory responses, the back from the notified bodies, of which there always are, and there will always be questions many of which that the writing team led by our team could address. Others, which are very regulatory focused, really are internal questions that, that an external vendor shouldn't be answering. We can certainly help support the answer by writing it, but we can't make those decisions. So we see all these regulatory responses. We see round one, we see round two. Um, we've even seen a few round threes and things are getting pretty tight at that point. Um, there are a lot of comments amongst our clients about notified body reviews. Are they even handed? Are they fair? Are they complete? Uh, you know, are they, are they doing a good job? If we do round one, uh, round two should be reviewed by the same reviewer. In our experience, I can't say that we have ever seen where round two, round one reviewer, Sally Smith, is replaced by John Doe as a reviewer in the second round or during the initial review process. So that's not our experience, uh, but we're not embedded in that. So our opinion is 
is that you asked the question, what's the opinion, our opinion? Our opinion is, is the notified bodies are people, and they come with varying degrees of expertise, bandwidth, and the ability to communicate effectively. And we, and some can't communicate their questions as clearly as others, thus causing maybe confusion on what the answer uh, answer should be, and causing the manufacturer to have to go back to the notified body to ask them to clarify their question. These are all things that we see, and it is challenging. Let's make this next one, Filippo, our last question. Sure. Must the safety and performance objectives have measurable acceptance criteria? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. Acceptance criteria, by definition, must be quantitative. Even if it's yes, no, are the answers. They have to be. They have to be measurable. So that is. That's a. That's a. I'll. I'll expand on my answer a bit. But that was a yes, no question, and the answer is yes. They do. Um, how do you get them? Is a. Is sometimes a. A, a different question. They, where do they come from? Where do acceptance criteria come from? They come from out of the state-of-the-art section because acceptance criteria are um, derived from data, actual data, that is um, extracted from your competitor device search. So if you have identified your safety and performance objectives, you know, rate of bleeding, periprocedural bleeding, survival at 30 days, um, very quantifiable types of safety and performance objectives, then you must find the answers to those data points in your competitor list, your competitor search. And then you're creating a table with those ranges, essentially, for every, let's just say, rate of death at 30 days. I'm just making that one up. And your competitors are, and that would be a, either, a, depending, it could be either a safety or a performance objective. Um, your competitors, and let's say you have, you have identified 35 articles of your competitors that you need to, that have data in them, that you need to extract for those acceptance criteria. On that, that table will have 35 rows, each one being a separate reference. And then your columns are going to be your safety and performance objectives. And you will identify out of each reference that reported it, that rate of death of 30 days at 2.8% for one reference, 6.9% for another, and on and on it goes. That's how you create a range. And uh, that's how you identify your safety and performance objectives and the acceptance criteria that they're related to. I, I think that's all. Yeah, that's all and the time we have for. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lori, for such a great session. Thank you. Thanks everybody for attending, and thank you, Filippo, for your um, moderation. Thank you. If anyone submitted a question that wasn't addressed, keep in mind that the speaker will reach out to you directly. This session was recorded. You will receive a notification in 24 hours when the on-demand session is available for viewing. Before you log off, please take a moment to complete the feedback form so we can continue to improve your digital week experience. And on behalf of your former Connect Life Sciences, have a great day.